Welcome to Navigating Change, everybody. My name is Pete Wright, and I'm sitting here with uh, Howard Teibel. How are you, Howard? Excellent, Pete. How was your week? It was fantastic. The weather has turned, the clouds have parted, and we've got blue <laughs> skies and warmth, and it just changes everything about me at the very core. I'm a really grouchy person during the winter. We are still, summer. at least at the moment, we are still uh, boarding Noah's Arks. <laughs> Seriously, it's bad. <laughs> well, that's not that's not good, and it particularly relates to our topic for today. Which, <laughs> right. and I'm going to just say this out loud. And I know I'm I don't think I'm the one. I, I don't think I'm alone. But um, I, whenever I walk into a meeting, uh, like a management meeting or something, where we're going to talk about this topic, it strike it makes me, it makes me frustrated. I'm not going to say <laughs> it makes me angry. Because, but it it makes me frustrated because I think why do we have to talk about this again? We're talking about attitude. Attitude yeah. has a stigma to it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I, I mean, how do you why why are we talking about attitude? And I say that rolling my eyes. Why are we talking about attitude, Howard? Why do we care? Well, I'm more interested. What what it, what is it about attitude that annoys you? You know, I'll tell you what it is. Because I feel like, uh, in my experience, being managed, that. Uh, managers t attempted to take too much authority in my attitude. Mm. That my attitude was a commodity. And I say that the royal my. I mean, there is a big effort to pass around these motivational books and, and to sign little notes in the front cover of these motivational books that says, pass it on if you get it. And sign your name that, that you read it and get it. I mean, I, that is a that's a uh, that's a real cultural gestalt in a lot of big organizations, and I think it frustrates a lot of people because we're naturally cynical of people who are happy. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, it, we, you and I were talking about this uh, the other day about you know you walk into a room and you find yourself frustrated about those people who are chronically happy i call them ch they have chp disorder they're chronically happy people <laughs> you know and you've got to believe when you look at someone like this you go there's got to be something wrong with this person because why aren't they in our business in our organization they should be uh, showing some level of dissatisfaction the way i'm feeling instead they're showing some optimism in the face of all this negativity and what this comes from, in my opinion, is something that I heard spoken by uh, uh, an author, Dr. Alan Zimmerman, spoke about this. I uh, heard him interviewed. He wrote a book called Pivot. And one of the things he said, which I think is so great, is no one gave you a bad attitude and no one can give you a good attitude. It's a choice you make every day. And the thing that I find compelling about this. It's not that an attitude is a choice, but it's a choice you make every day. And when you add the everyday part, what you realize is when you wake up in the morning, you know, we all know this, but we forget. I forget when I wake up in the morning that I actually could choose something different in the face of what's right in front of me. And I think that's very confronting for people because we so want to ascribe blame on others. And there is this culture of dissatisfaction that feeds on itself. And you have to work. You know, I was leading this workshop uh, a couple weeks ago, and it actually came out that people were uncomfortable showing satisfaction because it would stand out among their peers that they were actually in a pretty good place while people around them were feeling somewhat negative. And there is peer pressure to actually come off negative. Wow. Wow. That, you know, at once, I never kind of put my finger on that, but that is, I can absolutely categorically relate to that. Yeah, it's like you're going to, you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to stand up in the middle of a room and say, I'm in a good place. I'm happy. And what that does is I think people feel guilty about showing their sense of things being okay. And it's also a way to get accepted into a group. So, you know, one of the things uh, I would tell people that find themselves caught in that group is you might need to find a different set of people you hang around with. I got a great anecdote from a class I was in. 
uh, again, a class that we led, person raises their hand and they said, you know, I really wanted to improve my physicalness and my health. So I started going on a walk with a series of people from my office and we would walk at lunchtime and I'd come back from lunch and I would feel worse than I went out. And I would realize after around doing this four or five times that what was going was we spent the entire one hour of our walk complaining about our work. So here it is. I think I'm going out there doing something that's going to be health, healthy for me. And I came back feeling worse. And she said I had to make a choice to actually be around different people if I was to maintain a more positive attitude. Wow. You know, I just put my finger on another anecdote where this all began. And I think where? it's the eighth grade. <laughs> because eighth grade is that perfect age where it begins to fall apart. That's exactly right. And I think it falls apart when you start realizing that in the eighth grade, the cool kids are the ones who are learning how to smoke behind the gym. They're the angry kids. <laughs> and this is how it translates into today's organizations. We we are learning a lot more about the, you, you than you might want us to know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's maybe a little too much transparency. I uh, so take us to that next uh, that next level. Then, how do you? I, I think there are two questions on my mind, at least. One: How do you encourage people to make that choice on an individual level? How, what do you? How do you coach people to take more of an active and participatory role in their own attitude? And two: How do you help organizations encourage and stimulate positive attitudes without coming off as in, disingenuous? That's a pretty loaded question. Two really great questions. So, the, so the first one is: I think it starts with, I was going to say, starts with people making the choice that they want to make a change. Uh, sometimes it takes, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm reflecting back on this program that I'm doing at an organization where for some people, they are told to go to this program and they come in there with their arms crossed and they don't want to be there. And then some of them walk away going, you know what, I, I actually was surprised what I learned today. So I think it starts with a recognition that you have less than a, if you have less than a positive attitude, that that's what's going on. And I think you, there's a level of reflection that people have to take. Some people who know themselves, know them, know when they fall into that trap, they can pull themselves out. Others don't know. And if you don't know whether you have a positive or negative attitude, one of the things I would suggest is that you ask people that you trust to tell you the truth and say, listen, I'm really trying to make a change. Uh, what's your observation of how I am at work? You know, can even ask your spouse or your coworkers or your boss. So I think wanting to make the change goes a long way. Uh, and like I said, I think there is some understanding about the challenges people face that's important for people to sit down and think about. So for example, there is, there is, because I've seen this happen in organizations, we put a couple hundred people through a program uh, over the course of a six month period in the same institution. And invariably, the group walks out of there going, at the end, when we, when we sort of debrief and say, what did you learn today in how to acclimate to change? They would say things like, I, you know, it, it was so helpful to see that others around me are going through the same thing. So that's number one. Uh, then understanding that you're not alone in this is a way to help people say, you know what, it's not just me. It's it's there is something going around, but I still have a choice. I, I think part of the work also is to put in front of them that they do have a choice. And the way you can get them to realize this is to help explain what are some of the ways we all go through change. How do we adjust to change from first being frustrated by it to being confused to then acclimating and being comfortable? So that's something we do in these programs and it helps people become aware of it. We also talk about strengths and weaknesses. I think you, if you know your strengths and you know your weaknesses, you then can say, this is where I want to improve. And then finally, an action plan so that you can say, these are the things I want to do. You know, a very simple thing for people these days is taking some kind of classes. I work in a lot of institutions where 
classes are offered to people and many of them don't take advantage of it. And in times of uncertainty, there's nothing more powerful than putting yourself in a situation that's positive, where it's focused on learning. Otherwise, what ends up happening, your free time is going to be spent with looking at why things are, are wrong or why things are bad. So to the extent that you can focus on positive things, it will actually help you have a positive attitude. And also do the other thing is smile more. You know, it, it's funny. I, I find myself choosing to smile, and that may seem a little odd, but I can tell you that it reminds me that there is a way I could choose to be today in this moment, and it actually can have a ripple effect when you put that face on of smiling. And it's, you know, it's something we say to people if we're trying to coach them in uh, presentation skills, but I think this goes for just being in an organization. I think that's a that's a really great way to end this conversation, mostly because if you're smiling, more of the world is funny. And there's if you're nothing smiling. that's yeah, that's right. That's right. There oh we god. go. Singing? Am I singing? Oh my god, what was I thinking? All right, who's learning more about who now, Howard? Oh shoot. <laughs> there's nothing that's more of a self-fulfilling kind of uh, uh, manifest destiny than when you can when you can take in the world as funny. Uh, and uh, right. I, think, I think that is such an important life life lesson. This is good. I think this is good. This helps me. It's, it, this helps me. It's, there's there's levity. I'm smiling right now as a result. <laughs> thank you, you thank you again, Howard, for your time. Another week, another show. Uh, for everybody who's downloading and, and listening, thank you once again for your uh, valuable time. Make sure to check us out at Tybal Link. Uh, you can find the rest of the podcast. Make sure to head over to iTunes and search for us, Navigating Change, or Tybal Link, and you'll you'll be able to subscribe for free to the show. And until next week, this has been Navigating Change. Mm -hmm.